We feel like we've told this story before. It has the ring of the familiar to it, though we can't track down exactly where it might have been. Still, maybe it's worth hearing again. See, way back in the old, old days, the 27th century BCE, there was this princess, or possibly queen, the daughter or possibly wife of one of the legendary emperors of China. This princess, or possibly queen, was in the habit of taking a tea break each afternoon underneath one of the many mulberry trees that were scattered throughout the royal gardens. One day, during her break, something fell out of a mulberry tree and into her cup of tea. It was the cocoon of a moth. The princess, or possibly queen, rather than fishing the cocoon out of her hot cup of tea, swearing about Mother Nature messing up her drink, and throwing the whole mess out like we would, sat and watched as the heat and moisture began to either a. Spontaneously unravel the cocoon from one end of the garden to the other, b. Loosen the thread of the cocoon which was delicately teased apart by the princess or possibly queen and wrapped around her little finger, or c. It didn't fall into her tea at all because, for unspecified reasons, she'd been out collecting cocoons and decided to deliberately put one into her tea, hoping to... something. No one seems to know. Oh right, tea. This is an awful lot like the story of how China discovered tea. Boiling hot water under a tea tree, stray leaf, ta-da, tea. See our episode on it. At any rate, the princess, or possibly queen, then convinces her father, or possibly husband, to give her a grove of mulberry trees, and then sets about inventing the whole of the Chinese silk industry. She comes up with a silk reel to unite two separate threads into one, and the silk loom in order to make silk cloth. And that's the story of how China became the only country in the world to have silk, and so cornered the market on it. Well, that's what China would like you to believe. And sure, China was probably the first civilization to develop silk, and they certainly seem to have done so a long time ago, but if we go around believing everything China says, how long will it be before Shakespeare's plays turn out to have been written by a man named General Tso? See, the problem is that China didn't invent silk. We're pretty sure that was created by the silkworms themselves, and since there are a variety of different kinds of silk moth larvae, which is what silkworms are, that are capable of producing silk, a number of cultures had access to several kinds of wild silk and were happy to make use of it. Roughly the same time as the earliest discovered silk product in China, civilizations along the Indus River Valley were harvesting and using wild silk in and around Pakistan and India from at least two different species of moth larvae. The Chinese even knew about and imported silk products from the Roman Empire in the time of the Han Dynasty. Even the Aztecs showed signs of regular silk use in their civilization, and no one is even beginning to claim that the Silk Road ran as far as South America. And let's not forget that moths aren't the only things that create and use silk. Spiders do as well, and both the Roman and Greek armies use spider silk to make a sterile bandage to cover wounds and promote healing. So no, China did not have sole access to the only silk in use in the world. What China did do was work out how to cultivate silkworms and improve the quality of the thread and regularize the production in a process called sericulture. In essence, they domesticated the silkworm. And it was this process, rather than the silkworm or its cocoons, that was guarded so jealously by China for so many years. Because the silk coming out of China was so regularized that it was of a much higher quality was much easier to work with, and there was much more of it than practically anyone else. And it was this that gave them the edge in trading that would drive the growth and development of the Silk Road. It was sericulture that made it all work. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback.
It was pretty much inevitable when we said we were going to talk about the Silk Road that we would, at some point in the month, be talking about Silk. Well, here it is. The wait is over. We can all relax now. Although, to be fair, it isn't as if we've never talked about Silk and Silk making before, or the Silk Road for that matter. Way back in the 39th ever episode of GM Word of the Week, the one about the katana, we discussed the legendary but untrue measure of blade sharpness, the cutting of silk draped over the blade. Complete garbage, of course, as was most of the steel used in making katanas. The episode is right there for you to listen to before you start writing in again. In all, we've mentioned silk, the silk road, or silk making some 13 times by our count. There's katana, of course, gloves, socks, and surcoats, mirrors, scrolls, and gemstones, and Dead Reckoning, Saltpeter, and Monks, to name only a few. We mention it now not just to promote old episodes for your listening pleasure, but also to point out just how much Silk, the Silk Road, and related subjects work their way into history, science, technology, and economics. Especially economics, because as you'll recall from last week, Silk was some of the first stuff regularly traded by the Chinese in order to get the heavenly horses they were so desperate for. And anything you can trade for something else, that is, anything that two parties agree has some value, and that said thing can be exchanged for some other thing both parties agree has some value, is as basic as economics gets. And silk certainly had value. It had been used for years in China as a currency, hundreds of years before it ever entered the Silk Road as a tradable commodity. By the time of the Han Dynasty, silk had become so valuable in and around China that it was used to pay government officials. And in much the same way we would say something was worth its weight in gold, the Chinese knew the value of something as worth its length in silk. So much so that it was the monetary standard in China. Which is why the Han Emperor used it to pay off our old friends the Zhongnu when they came raiding. And they were happy to have it. Even outside of China, silk was a valuable product to have. In Egypt, silk was found in the tomb of a mummy dating back to 1070 BCE, and the Greeks and Romans, even before being connected up to the Silk Road, knew of a people they called the Ceres, or People of Silk, and knew they came from China. The Romans probably found out about silk thanks to the Battle of Carhae in 53 BCE. The Romans were fighting the Parthian Empire, from what is pretty much modern-day Iran, at a place near Haran, Turkey. Led by Marcus Licinius Crassus, he of the unorthodox method of real estate acquisition we talked about in our Fighting Fire episode, the Romans had come to town because Crassus felt he didn't have enough money to be getting on with already, even though he was, quite probably, the richest man in the world at the time. He didn't have any business being there, the invasion wasn't approved by the Roman Senate, and he ignored all the advice and offers of help from people who knew what they were talking about in favor of charging straight at the Parthians after a treacherous desert crossing. To thank Crassus for all the trouble they'd had to go to getting the entire army out, the Parthian cavalry rode down the Roman forces and killed or captured most of them. Crassus sought a truce, but things went badly and negotiations broke down. Both sides scuffled again, and Crassus was killed. The reason the silk comes into it is that reputedly, when the Romans first saw the Parthian cavalry coming, they got panicky because the entire army was riding under long flowing banners of silk, which caught the wind and the sun and left them in awe, leading in part to the Roman defeat. Once they got over losing Crassus, the Romans really took to silk. In fact, by 30 BCE, once Rome had conquered the Egyptians, a serious trade in silk sprung up between the Romans and the Parthians, which opened Asia to Roman goods and allowed the Romans to suck up all the silk they could get. The Parthians would trade for silk in China and then turn around and trade all that off to the Romans for gold, which they would then trade to the Chinese for more silk. Wash, rinse, repeat. My hand, please, just to be safe. Unfortunately, so voracious was the appetite for silk among the Romans that some people began to see it as a moral failing to wear silk, 
Soon, the use of it was restricted to the very upperest of upper classes of Roman society thanks to sumptuary laws enacted by the Senate. For more on sumptuary laws, see our episode on purple. But suffice it to say that the laws enacted against silk were meant to restrict it to the upper class and probably avoid a trade imbalance whereby a greater and greater demand for silk would mean more and more Roman goods would have to be traded for less and less actual silk. Even as it was, so much gold was on its way out of Rome to bring silk in that it was soon seen as immoral and decadent to be seen in silk clothing at all. So, by the time the Silk Road really got rolling, silk was already nearly as popular as it could be. Everybody who was anybody had to have it, even the people who, strictly speaking, weren't allowed to have it. China was already famous for silk and had been sending it around the known world for centuries. But as we said, they weren't the only ones who produced silk. Wild silk from over 500 species of wild silkworm was widely available. In fact, India has long been a producer of at least four major types of wild silk, mulberry, tassar, muga, and eri. Mulberry silk naturally comes from the same moth larva, Bombyx mori, that Chinese silks do. The larva feeds on mulberry leaves and produces the silk cocoon when it is ready to pupate, but more on that in a minute. Tassar silk comes from a different genus of moth, Anthurea, the individual species of which feed on anything from oak to native Indian trees called sal trees. The sal tree is another one of those ridiculously useful plants that seem to turn up everywhere in India and southern Asia, much as the Indian jujube tree has. And, like the lac bug to the jujube, so too are species of the Anthurea silkworm to the sal tree. They'll eat the leaves off the tree, killing it, but the silk they produce is so valuable, it's almost a toss-up as to which is more economically profitable, the tree or the bug. Tessar silk has a dull golden sheen, and about 130 tons of it are produced every year. The Assam silk moth from the Assam state in India produces Muga silk. Thanks to its glossy yellowish gold tint, it was reserved for the clothing of royalty. One of its more interesting properties is that the more you hand wash it, the better it looks. Airy silk comes from a single species of caterpillar found in northeast India, bits of China, and Japan. The larva feeds mostly on the leaves of the castor plant, from which we get castor oil, and cultivated larvae are often fed cassava leaves instead. They produce a softer, fluffier silk. Muga and Airy silk account for about another 100 tons of silk a year, just from India. And of course, that brings up the obvious question. Why then did the Chinese virtually corner the silk market for several thousand years? Well, the problem is, unless you are a sericulturist, your silk is still inferior to Chinese silk produced by Bombyx mori larvae. Until you knew how the Chinese did it, what the whole sericulture process was, your silk just didn't have what it took to create the finest fabric in the world. If we presume, for a moment, that the story about the princess and the tea is, if not false, at least apocryphal, we are still left with the fact that someone, somewhere in China, was really paying attention to the world around them and to the silkworm moth in particular. Silk production doesn't come into being any other way. You have to have studied the entire life cycle of Bombyx mori, the one moth that produces Chinese silk, in detail to work out what needed to be done to produce silk thread in sufficient quantity to make it all worthwhile. The basic cycle is this. The silkworm moth comes along and lays three to five hundred eggs on a mulberry tree. About 14 days later, these eggs hatch out into silkworm caterpillars or larvae. The caterpillars go through a series of molts, shedding skin as they become larger. After the fourth such molt, the caterpillar spins a cocoon around itself and begins pupating. These pupae will, a few days later, secrete a special chemical which breaks down the cocoon, allowing the adult silkworm moth to emerge and begin the cycle again. At least, that's how it would work if Bombyx mori hadn't been domesticated. What we've just told you is the process for its nearest relative, Bombyx mandarina, a wild silk moth. 
Unfortunately, Bombix Mori hasn't got what you might call a natural life. Instead, Mori's life goes like this. The male silkworm moth is introduced to the female silkworm moth by humans. Neither of them can fly, and so are unable to breed naturally thanks to 5,000 years of domestication aimed at increasing the moth's size and silk production and reducing the amount of time they spend in any one stage of their development in order to maximize the speed with which they produce a cocoon. The female is then placed in a specially prepared tray among carefully selected white mulberry leaves to lay as many eggs as she can. These eggs are incubated, soon hatch out, and the larvae begin eating as much of the mulberry as possible. They quickly go through four molts and then begin spinning a little net with which to hold themselves off the ground as they take the next few days to make complete cocoons around themselves. Once this is done, one of two things happen. Either the cocoons are allowed to pupate in order to produce more moths, or the cocoons are harvested and either thrown into boiling water to kill the larva and begin the silk harvesting process, or the cocoon has a needle driven through it to kill the larva and is then thrown into hot water. Fun times! Let's face it, there's no glamour in the life of Bombix Mori. They've been bred to do exactly one thing, produce as much silk as possible as quickly as possible. As a result, not only can they not fly, they've lost any and all color they might ever have had. They're just little gray things with wings too small for their bodies. They don't exist in the wild at all and wouldn't survive even if they did. They are entirely dependent on humans in every aspect of their lives. It's important to understand that what really makes the silk from B. Mori so valuable and so different from its wild counterparts, aside from the millennia of selective breeding, is that the full growth process is interrupted before the moth is allowed to emerge from the cocoon. Yes, you could still harvest the silk from used cocoons, but you get an inferior type of silk instead of the single, mile-long thread you would get by unraveling an unopened cocoon. Wild silk moths, remember, use a chemical to essentially cut their way out of the cocoon, thereby turning one thread into randomly sized multiple threads. These then have to be joined back together in some way, which leaves the resulting silk thread much more coarse than silk produced from one uninterrupted thread. In addition, cultured silk threads are much easier to color and much more durable than those produced by B. Mori's wild cousins. The thousands of years of development of sericultured silk made it the prime product against which all others were compared and often found lacking. Once the cocoons are in the hot water, the gum the larva produces to stick the whole cocoon together begins to dissolve, allowing the thread to be unraveled. This is then wound onto silk reels. Of course, the whole thread isn't useful. For a variety of reasons, only a small amount of the silk spun by a single larva is used. So it takes about 2,500 cocoons, each yielding about 1,000 yards of silk, to make one pound of silk. So you see, it wasn't really the cocoons or the larvae themselves that were the most carefully guarded secrets. Without knowing how the entire sericulture process worked, you weren't going to accomplish much. The caterpillars would either die off or turn into moths, which would then also die probably without having produced any eggs for the next generation. And even if you did get that part of things up and running, you really had your work cut out for you trying to work out what to actually do to get any usable silk out of the process. Failure was a near certainty as long as you didn't know how it all worked, which was what the Chinese were really protecting. Still, secrets will eventually get out. Sometime around 300 CE, a Japanese expedition managed to not only smuggle out silkworm eggs, but also capture four young Chinese girls who were made to teach the sericulture process. Suddenly, Japan was in the silk game. And then... In the mid-6th century CE, disaster for the Chinese really struck. See, even though lots of places in the known world were now producing silk, it still managed to be not quite as good as the Chinese stuff, and certainly not as desirable. Everyone wanted the Chinese silks, and this gave anyone involved in getting Chinese silk to the rest of the world a lot of power to wield. When the Romans began fighting with the Sassanid Empire, and the Roman-Persian Wars kicked off, Getting silk into Europe became virtually impossible, 
because the Persians, who basically sat between the Chinese and everyone else geographically, simply stopped all trade with everyone while the war was happening. This meant there was no real path into Europe for any silk. Justinian I, Eastern Roman Emperor in Byzantium, didn't much like that, so he set out to find a way around the Persian-induced scarcity by getting Byzantium into the silk game. Fortunately for him, two monks had been making the rounds in India spreading the good news to the Indian subcontinent. As they wandered around, they eventually stumbled into China, where they just happened to get a really good look at the entire sericulture process, which was a real eye-opener for them because up to that point, almost everyone in Byzantium thought silk actually came from India. We can only assume the Indian Silk Marketing Board was doing a bang-up job at the time. When the monks made it back to Byzantium the following year, they couldn't help but tell their story to Justinian, who was no less shocked than they were to discover all those Indian silk brochures he had laying around the palace were a bunch of malarkey. However, Justinian not being a fool, he immediately realized what this meant. The monks knew all about the silk production process, all he needed was to find some silkworms, and Byzantium could go into business making silk for everywhere west of the Persians. All of Europe, in fact. So he sat the monks down and he promised them things. No one knows exactly what, but they must have been very important things because the two monks agreed to go back to China and try smuggling out some silkworms, an offense punishable by death if they were caught. Everything agreed to, the monks set out along a northerly route back into China. Once they were back in China, and details are a bit sketchy here, they acquired a few silkworm eggs and hid them inside bamboo rods. Unfortunately, on the way back home, the eggs hatched, and the silkworms looked like they weren't going to arrive in Byzantium before they cocooned. If that happened, the monks would have done a lot of work for nothing, as the moths would have emerged and then died before they could return home. Fortunately, everyone made it back before the cocooning happened, and the monk's church was able to get into the business of silk production thanks to some mulberry trees they just happened to have already laying around the place. Soon, silk factories in Constantinople, Beirut, Antioch, and elsewhere around the Byzantine Empire were in business producing silks for all of Europe. In fact, so good were they that the empire soon had the monopoly on silk production, and the long monopoly of the Chinese empire was finally broken. For the next 650 years, silk became the foundation of the economy of Byzantium, right up until the end of the empire in 1204. And that, more or less, is the story of sericulture, the real secret the Chinese tried so hard to protect. And proof if you needed it, that process is as important as product, if not more so. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. Be sure to come by again next week as we wrap up this whole Silk Road business. Get it? Wrap up? Silk? Business? No? Never mind. Thanks go out to our patrons on Patreon once again. It is their continued efforts that make the show possible and keep things running relatively smoothly. As smooth as... No? Fine, have it your way. If you'd like to join them and help support the show, head off to gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top of the page. We do a lovely monthly chat for our $5 supporters in which we talk about things show-related and solicit ideas for future episodes. Once again, The Silk Road, a very short introduction by James A. Millward, was indispensable help in producing this episode, a link for which can be found in the description for this episode. GM Word of the Week's Sericulture was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who has had any number of sow's ears lately and not a clue what to do with them. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. With time and patience, the mulberry leaf becomes a silk gown.